I got all excited about telling my story. And then I was out moving, uh, moving cattle around about well, middle of September and it hit me that about some two months, I gotta give a presentation talking in front of people and my heart started to pound and I started to sweat. And what was I gonna talk about? And while it came to the realization that I guess I gotta talk about high energy grazing because that's kind of one of the theories that I'm trying to trying to uh, complete. So that's my father, Brian. He's the one that uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'll just kind of do it in a story form. My, my father, Brian, he's the one that set the foundation for our family to uh, use holistic management and plan grazing. And he, built the foundation that we could grow on and build ideas off of, things like that. My mother, she's a happy grandma. She's got 17 grandkids, right? Yep. 17 grandkids. Um, she's been a rock for our family, so. And that's our family, all in complete. So, good luck. You gotta have more kids. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. And I'll, uh, that's me and my wife. So, but I'll start off and uh, after I graduated high school, didn't really have a whole lot of idea what I wanted to do. I, found, I moved to Fargo, I tried college, I did that for a couple weeks and realized that wasn't the path I wanted to take. Got a few jobs. I moved back to home, worked on the ranch. Moved back to Fargo, got another job, wanted to party. Moved back to home, worked on the ranch. <coughs> got, yeah. got a hair up my ass to move out to Colorado, work at a ski resort. Ended up getting claustrophobic from mountains. Had to move back home, work on the ranch. And then uh, sitting on uh, I was a part-time bartender and I was sitting in the bar I was just I was working and it was just me and one of my buddies and uh, I told him I don't really have a lot of direction in my life I don't know what I want to do I said I was gonna join the guards and uh, he looked at me and said well if you're gonna join I'll I'll join with you so in January the next that next January after New Year's we went to the recruiting station we joined and in March we both shipped out to uh, boot camp and got back in July. And uh, and uh, at the, in the fall of 2007, I, that's when I met my wife after I got back from the boot camp. Um, worked at Camp Grafton for two and a half years. And in the summer of 2010, we got a deployment notice that we were getting shipped out ended up spending a year over overseas we we're stationed in kuwait so our our duties there was um to prepare the units coming out of iraq for the drawdown so what we did is we set tents up we built we built bunks bunk houses um built cafeterias and things like that we were uh we were an engineering unit, so we were carpenters, electricians, and plumbers. <coughs> and uh, spent a year doing that, playing softball, doing other things over there. But I mean, it, you know, it was a it was a good experience, one that I never want to do again. Oh, um, then that when I got I got home in August of 2012, and I started ranching with my family again and that winter the local paper did an article about me going overseas and that got the attention of one of the neighbor ranchers there who was looking to retire and passing his ranch off to someone so he got a hold of my father <coughs> and slowly began the process of handing that as a ranch over to me and my wife. And as a family for a couple of years, we leased his cows and leased his land until I was ready to take over all of it on our own. 
And that's where Maddock Ranch was born. And we moved, we moved out to that place in uh, fall of 2014. And then 2015 is when I was, 2015 was when I was going to get my feet wet. I made a lot of mistakes. I think that's the year that cattle price hit. I think feeder prices were three dollars. They were selling bread cows for three thousand dollars a head. And what did I do? I went out and bought a bunch of cows. <laughs> registered cows. Purebred registered cows. Thinking I'm going to get in the oh man. This market's going to be great, and we're going to we're going to do good. And there's no end to this thing. They're talking eight-year high trend on this thing. And boy, I thought we were going to be rolling in the dough. And then 2016 happened. <laughs> Actually, we had a pretty good year in 2016. But, um, and uh, then another thing I did that year too is I went out and uh, started filling up all this land with cattle and with high cattle prices came high hay prices and I didn't have a lot, enough hay to feed all these cows so I had to go out and purchase all this hay to feed all these cows and that, that really hurt. So that, so that winter I started broadening, or I thought I got to do something different. Me and my life in 2013, I take Josh Ducart's holistic management class and we kind of got an idea of what dad had been talking about all these years and kind of started to understand, but I knew there was more I needed to learn. And so I started uh, watching YouTube videos in the winter of 2016, 2015, 2016, and I watched and I watched, and I learned from these. I learned so much from these guys, probably a three-month period, just YouTube videos and researching what they're talking about. And that is Greg Judy, Jim Garish, Joel Salton, and Gabe Brown, <clears throat> and. They all have different ways of doing it, but the principles are all the same. And after that year, I told my wife, I told my wife that, you know, we gotta come up with a better plan of what we're doing. We were doing the rotational grazing. We were moving once a week and it was, it was working, but I knew we could do better. And, uh, so that's where I came up with high energy grazing. And the idea behind high energy grazing is we're taking a third off the plant where that's the highest energy content of that, that plant species, that plant. And then we're moving on. And our, it's, we're rapidly grazing these, these plants and our cows are never in one spot more than a day. And I'll go around those pastures. With that, I've been able to go around those pastures incredibly three times a year without destroying the resource and actually adding to the resource. So and I, I kind of came up with a, a theory of 33, 33, and 33. And so I'm taking 33% of that plant, I'm trampling 33% of that paddock, and I'm leaving 33% of that paddock to stand. So when we actually do get rain, it'll actually slow down the flow of water and capture it back into the soil profile. In, 20, in 2017 and 2018, we're dealing with drought. You can see how brown that grass is, but how green those leaves are. That's at the end of August. And our grass is just browned up completely. And that was last year. So, so with the combined, in 2017 and 2018, we had a combined total inch of moisture, or combined total of 13 inches of moisture through the, those two years. And like Norm Justin said before, I've never experienced that. And that's a lot of pressure. So what did I do? I put knowledge to work and I started 
we started building these paddocks and started putting water in. And this isn't current, but now I'm running, I got over 38 paddocks in this whole system with temporary fencing and permanent fencing. And there's seven tanks in this system. And I got it, there's a coolie, and that follows a coolie system. So I have, a, I have a water points in those coolie systems too. And we're starting to see results. What's going on? So the biology is really starting to come alive with this, with this uh, program we're running. This is all spider webs on an early morning. And you want to talk about fly control. You know, how many flies are they capturing and keeping off your cows? Here's a picture of our cows this year, getting ready to move to the next paddock, all bundled up like that. So that's a, that was last year. And the, the cows had been on there for about 12 hours. I mean, it had a nice trample effect on that. That was the same paddock 30 <coughs> days later. This is some of the ground we've been doing cover crops on and using this philosophy of high energy grazing. And the soil aggregates and the biology that are just exploding in this these soils. So I did a one foot by one foot um, square square and dug it up and I dug down three inches and counted the earthworms that were in there. And I had 12 earthworms in that one foot square area. And I don't know what the number is, but I'm somewhere around that 7 to 800,000 earthworms per acre, if that holds true throughout that whole profile. And that was in the middle of July when we were when we were getting really dry again. This is on land that was conventionally tilled, as far as we know, for 50, 60, 70 right. years up until you got it. Right. <clears throat> so it was just, and you, you've been on there, what, three or four years now? <coughs> four years. So you've had that turnaround in three or four years. Mm -hmm. So, and then this year in 2018, when I started off on my own in 2015, I ran 206 head of cattle. That's all I did. And we had two. We have two different major land or pastures. One is 800 acres, and one is 400 acres. And I ran 206 head of cattle across those that 1,200 acres. This year, I ran. 260 head of cattle in a drought using this philosophy plus plus we had 80 head of sheep on the same system and we still got and we're still out grazing to this day so that's what a cow looked like this was at the end of June, that's what a cow looks like when you're moving that fast and she's getting that high energy bite. And I guarantee you, she looked a lot worse than that coming on the pasture. But she, that's what these cows are doing is they're putting rapid weight gain on when we're getting hit in pasture and we're moving them rapidly like that. Here's our sheep. My first year this summer with sheep. So, I've been saying it for several months now. I wish I would have bought 200 more. So, they've been just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those are you can find <laughs> I actually, I actually told my dad, I've seen your dad. But, uh, um, we started off, we were doing once a day moves, and I wasn't getting the impact I wanted to get. So, I started, I went to 12 hour moves. So I'd go out in the morning, I'd move the sheep, and then I would, took on some carpentry work this summer. So I'd go a carpenter, and then I'd come back that evening, and then I'd go move the sheep again. And this grass, the grass just exploded out there. And we're, we're working on that. Um, that's six inches of rain, you know, that's 
for the year. I mean, that's we're dry. This is dry, dry. We're uh, we're diversifying our enterprises. So we're uh, custom grazing. We got a cow calf. We got heifer development. We got sheep. And our direct marketing, <laughs> grass fed beef. This is some of the meat we just brought home here last week. So we couldn't wait. We had to tear it open and put it around the frying pan. And I tell you what, it's delicious. It's good stuff. Well, and that's my family. Well, my girl Aubrey and my baby girl Emery. Well, that's the reason I do this. And I, I love what I do. So, and the way I'm doing it, it just, it simplifies things so much. And so, and they're, they're they go out with me as much as they possibly can. So, that's all I got. It was short and sweet, but any questions? You're running your sheep separate from the cow? This year, the plan, since it was my <laughs> first year with sheep, I didn't know how I wanted to do it. And, uh, so I was a little hesitant about putting them out with the cows right away, but now that I've got a little more comfort with them, next year the plan is just to get them out with the cows. and I'm going to run them behind the cows. So I got a lot of brush in my uh, pastures from years and years of continuous grazing and whatever. I'm going to use the sheep as a brush control for that. So hopefully we can eradicate some. I have been... I have been taking these uh, portable fencing and moving cows in the really small areas and trying to trample brush down, and that's having I'm having some success with it. But so I'm not familiar with sheep, but are you, would you find that then they're gonna beat down your chew grass more, or are they gonna stick to more of that shrub types? Well, with because I've been I use that rapid high energy grazing with the sheep too. And so if I, you know, if I stick to my 12-hour rule, I don't think I'm going to have a lot of damage on that grass because the cows had already gone across it anyway. Right. That's so, what I was just wondering. If you're coming in after the cattle, are they still going to eat that trampled grass, or will they go into the other stuff that the cattle didn't touch? I think for the most part, they'll just eat the other stuff. Right. Great. So do you have a market for your sheep? No, not yet. But that's the plan. So they're just these were yearling use. So we haven't even turned our rams out yet. No. So, but that's the plan. Hopefully, as we develop the market for that, and actually dropped some beef off at a guy's place yesterday or last week, and he said, "Do you got any grass-fed lamb?" I was like, "Maybe next Maybe. year." <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of South Africans that work in that area. I've had over I've had 15 phone calls this summer. Are you gonna butcher any of those? Are you gonna butcher any of those? <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> and so, your grass fed beef program, are you doing yearling cow that you're slaughtering? Or what's they're your three, They're three year old, or they're they're coming, gonna be three year old. So, I just butchered them at 30 months. They're 28 months here when I butchered them. So, yeah. Well, since the start of the high density, have you seen the, the warm seasons come back into that? I did. So especially where those sheep were grazing, I had a tremendous blow up of uh, big blue snakes come. Which, where they were at, I ran them just right around the house because like I said, I was, little, I was a little nervous about coyotes and things. I didn't know how, I use electro netting to move them. And I was a little nervous. I didn't know how, predator, how much predator control is in that. So I wanted to keep them around the house, around the yard and stuff. Where they were at, that was an old hay field. And it was farms 15, 20 years ago, you know, perennial crop or annual cropping. And then 15 years ago, the farmer hired our dad to plant up. Yeah, put alfalfa grass in it. And um, it was hay and hay and hay. And we actually hated it for a few years. And then I hated it for two years after I went on my own. And then last year, I ran year or I ran my grass fed cattle on it. And then this year I ran my grass fed cattle on one side of it and I ran the sheep on the other. And the, the there to my knowledge there's never I've never 
no one believes it. Big boobs kind of being seen about there. But <coughs> that and uh, red clovers really starting to blow up out in there. So it's really doing some wild things. So when you're moving your um, your grass finish stuff, are you you're just sticking to the 12 hour kind of movements? Or? With the the with the cattle? When you're finishing, yeah, cattle. Yeah. I'm doing that on a daily basis. Okay. Yeah. So so on you know on a, I I think I've developed a grazer's eye where I can go out and say well I need this much for these 15 head for this day, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm getting pretty close to it. So some days, sometimes some paddocks, you know, it needs a, I should have moved them the night before. Sometimes, you know, they need an extra half day on that pasture to get the effect that I want. So, yeah. Any more questions? Thank you.